Thank you very much uh, for a wonderful introduction, and uh, really glad to be here and uh, share with you some of the things that uh, we are doing. Uh, but uh, admittedly, uh, if we uh, go back and uh, see uh, our achievements in the last uh, 200 years of uh, modern chemistry and the Industrial Revolution, uh, we really don't have uh, too much to be proud of. Uh, for a simple reason, uh, look at uh, the machines we build, they don't really perform. Uh, look at the houses uh, we build, uh, some of them don't survive uh, severe earthquakes. Yet, I wouldn't blame uh, our scientists for a simple reason. We didn't have much time. 200 years is not enough time uh, to make some wonderful materials as nature uh, have been able to uh, make for us in the last uh, three billion years of evolution. And we wish we had in our possession some of the materials and machines that uh, nature was able uh, to develop for us. Now, one of the examples I like to uh, always show is uh, uh, sequoia trees. Sequoia trees um, are there standing um, for uh, hundreds and thousands of years, uh, carrying hundreds of tons uh, in uh, uh, very harsh weather conditions, uh, cold, uh, UV light, uh, uh, high temperatures. In fact, I'm not uh, familiar with any plastic chair that can survive such harsh conditions. Uh, which is made of synthetic material. Um, yet, uh, if we ask ourselves, uh, what is it made of? I mean, how come that this uh, tree is uh, so strong? So if we look by high resolution electron microscope into the structure of the tree, uh, all of a sudden we find that there is a nanofiber, which is about 100 nanometer uh, long, and about uh, uh, 5 to 10 nanometer uh, wide. Uh, yet, it is extremely strong, but Surprisingly, it's made of sugar, you know, the same sugar we uh, drink in our tea. Um, well, not exactly, it's, it's not a, a sucrose, it's actually a homopolymer of uh, glucose, which is called cellulose. Even that is not so accurate because it's actually a fiber, a highly crystalline fiber made of polymers of that cellulose. And this crystalline nanocellulose is so strong that in fact, on a weight basis, it is 10 times stronger than steel, and yet it's sugar. So analysts all over the world uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so are saying that nanocellulose or nanocrystalline cellulose is going to be one of the uh, uh, two most important nanomaterials for the entire industry. And we're talking about a, a sports, about medicine, uh, transportation, uh, uh, space, whatever. The other, the other one, by the way, is uh, people believe it's going to be the graphene. Now, Here's the problem. Say that uh, uh, six, seven years ago you wanted to buy half a ton of nanocellulose uh, to build a house or an airplane or whatever. Um, you could Google, you could even, you could even Alibaba. You couldn't find it. Well, why is that? Because there was no commercial source. Of course, you would find tens of thousands of scientific papers where scientists say that this is a wonderful material and we wish we had it. So we at the Hebrew University, together with partners uh, from uh, uh, Sweden, uh, Finland, uh, Italy, and Germany, uh, a, in a consortium that was funded by the European Commission, um, a, a started a research plan. And the idea was to uh, develop a technology that will uh, uh, enable us to produce cost-effectively on, on a commercial scale nanocellulose. So the first thing that we were looking for is a source uh, of raw material. Now, of course, we didn't want to cut uh, sequoia trees, and in fact, there is no reason for that, because cellulose is everywhere. But we found a particular uh, source which is very useful for us, and that the sludge of the paper industry. Now, why the sludge of paper industry is so interesting? Well, first of all, because there is a lot of that. In fact, it almost covers our continents. Europe alone produce anywhere between 11 to 12 million ton of that material annually, and there is nothing other than landfilling to do with that. So imagine uh, it is the equivalent of uh, uh, a mountain three kilometer high sitting on a soccer field. And we produce this mountain every year. 
So for everybody, it's an environmental problem, and for us, it's a good source of raw material. So today, uh, a company was established uh, called Melodia. Uh, we secured investment from Holman. Holman is a, is a very large uh, Swedish uh, forestry and pulp and paper company. And today in Israel, we produce on commercial scale in Haifa, uh, not where the ammonia is, somewhere else. We are producing uh, nanocellulose uh, cost-effectively. And in fact, also uh, more recently in another factory in Sweden. So now the question is, what can you do with that? Well, a lot of things. One of the nice things about nanocellulose is that it is suspended in water. And it is, in fact, clear as that water you, you see here. And why? Because the, the nanofibers are smaller than uh, uh, the wavelength uh, at the uh, visual range. But once you take these, uh, this suspension of, of nanocellulose in water and you, you put it on any substrate, once the water evaporates, it self-assembles into an extremely strong film, transparent film. So just to give you a feel, it's about 120 megapascal. Just uh, uh, for comparison, it is as twice as strong as epoxy glue. And remember, there is no covalent bond. It's only hydrogen bonding and some van der Waals interactions. It's simply the fact that it is well-ordered structure. But in addition to that, if you look deep into the structure by high-resolution electron microscopy, you see that between the layers, there are gaps of about 20 to 30 nanometer. And that enables us now to mix into the nanocellulose some other nanoparticles, for example, to change spectral properties, electrical properties, and so on. So that's exactly what we are doing. And here is an example of semi-transparent film, which is strong, mixed with carbon nanotubes that introduce electrical conductivity. And that uh, material can be very useful for a lot of applications like printed electronics, smartphones, uh, touch screens, and so on. Another interesting application uh, is to make it hydrophobic. So by surface modification of the nanocellulose, we have been able to develop a super hydrophobic aerogel that uh, this material, as you can see here, uh, uh, really repel water effectively, but on the other hand, on the right-hand side, down there, you can see it, we can absorb very effectively uh, a, a, a organic solvents. Uh, just to give you a feel, one gram of that aerogel absorbed 200 gram of chloroform. So it's quite amazing. Now, what you can, can you do with that nanocellulose? Uh, one interesting application is 3D printing. Now, interestingly enough, we are actually printing water because it's only 3% nanocellulose, so it's 97% water. The reason for that is because of the thixotrophic properties of the nanocellulose that introduce into the water. So the, the, thin, or the shear thinning that we introduce into the material reduces its viscosity by three to four orders of magnitude. That enables us to push it through the very thin orifice of the head of the 3D printer. But once it hits the target, it solidifies. So we solidify water. So you can see here some nice structures that once you remove the water, you end up with an aerogel. The other interesting application for such a material is for printing buildings. And in fact, uh, I was fortunate to uh, 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 collaborate with a group of, oops, sorry. I was fortunate to work with a group of uh, architect, architects uh, that uh, won the, uh, the bid uh, to, um, oh, okay, it's fine, you can see it, um, uh, to, to demonstrate uh, the Israeli pavilion in the Biennale uh, for Architecture in, in Venice uh, last year. And here we demonstrated 3D printing of a shelter in the desert that is all made of nanocellulose and some combining materials to introduce, for example, uh, electrical conductivity, superhydrophobicity. So here you could see we collect some water uh, from uh, early uh, dew. Uh, we can make um, a photovoltaic uh, cells, which are uh, semi-transparent, and all that material is only nanocellulose. Now, the nice thing about this uh, structure that you can print it uh, on the spot 
is that once you, uh, uh, you build it, once you, you finish uh, with that, you can enjoy it. And then if you, you don't want it, you just plow it into the ground and that's it, because everything there is a renewable material. Can you help me exit it? Thank you. Well, I hope I uh, convinced you that the plant kingdom provided us uh, with a wonderful material, which is the nanocellulose, very useful. But it's not the only one. Uh, take, for example, the insect kingdom. For the last 12 years, we've been working with this interesting uh, creature, which is called the cat flea. Cat fleas are really interesting creatures because they are able to jump as high as 200 times their height. This is quite amazing considering the fact that it's the equivalent of a person standing in the middle of Manhattan and in a single jump go to the top of the Empire State Building. Now I know that many people would like to, to have this ability, but the qu real question is how come the cat fleas are able to do it? It turns out that uh, during evolution they've been able to develop this nanocomposite which is made of protein called resilin. Now resilin, uh, in simple words, is the most elastic material on Earth. In fact, you can squish it, you can stretch it, and it stores all the energy. It doesn't lose any energy by, uh, to, the, to the environment by friction or heat. And once you release it, snap, it brings back all the energy. So that's how cat fleas are able to jump. Now, we, of course, would like to have uh, such a material, and uh, uh, catching uh, cat fleas is not a good idea because first of all they're jumpy so it's difficult to catch them but in addition even if you caught few you don't have much material but really you don't need to do that so what you could do is to just clone the gene and that's exactly what we did we cloned the gene from the cat flea that enabled it to produce the resin and introduce it by genetic engineering to a less jumpy organism which is a plant so now we have the ability to produce a lot of that material We've done another trick here, because I told you that in cat fleas, this mechanism uh, of a jumping pad is a composite. It's a composite of resilin and a stiff nanofiber, which is called chitin. We don't like to work with chitin. We like to work with nanocellulose, for the reason I told you before. So we replace the chitin binding domain with the cellulose binding domain. So now we have a protein which is elastic and can make a composite with nanocellulose. So now the question, what can you do with that? Well, for once, we wanted to see if we can really produce these jumping uh, structures. So we uh, combined nanocellulose with resin. And I have here a short video to demonstrate. On the right hand side, you can see this nanocellulose foam with no resin. So I squish it and you can see that uh, it has only plastic behavior. It's no, it doesn't jump back. On the left hand side, it's exactly the same foam, but with resin. Look what happened. So you can see, that you can hear that the students are excited. Uh, so this is very nice. And the question is, what can you do with that? Well, this is just one example. Uh, we're working now with ON. ON is a Swiss company that makes uh, uh, next generation sport shoes uh, for athletes that would like to have better performance. Um, well, I hope that by now I convinced you that nanobiomaterials are really great and better than synthetics. Well, there is still one section, at least in this audience, I'm sure, which are the orthopedic surgeons that are not very convinced because you continue to uh, uh, implant in our body synthetic implants. And I'm going to say that this is probably not a great idea. And why is that? Because synthetic material fails. Just as this plastic fork that is not strong enough for its performance, well, sometimes these synthetic implants are too strong. And therefore, their mechanical properties do not really fit the surrounding tissues. But the real reason why I think it's a bad idea is because in nature, things are done differently. In nature, there is no one there that takes my head and screw it into my neck. There is no one that takes my skin and glue it onto my body. In nature, everything is self-assembled. In fact, every living organism, whether it is a fish, or a snake, or plant, or human being, or cat flea. 
It's all made of cells, and each cell contains DNA, and the DNA encodes four nanobio building blocks. Many times there are proteins, other times there are enzymes that make other things like fatty acid polysaccharides. But the common things about all these nanobio building blocks is that they need no one. They are able to self-assemble into scaffolds on which cells are proliferating and growing to make and develop into tissues that organize into organs and altogether it's life. So we at the Hebrew University about 13 years ago decided to focus on probably the most important nanobio building blocks, at least for human beings, and that's collagen. Now, why collagen? First of all, collagen accounts for about 30% of our dry weight. Give you a few examples, which I'm sure many of you know. Bone, 50% collagen, 50% mineral. Uh, our skin is about 70% collagen. Uh, tendons and ligaments, close to 100% collagen. So I always like to say that anyone who is in the business of replacement parts for human being would like to have collagen. But admittedly, and I'm sure that this audience is, is definitely aware of that, even 13 years ago, there were already on the market more than 1,000 medical implants made of collagen. You know, simple things like dermal fillers to augment the uh, uh, lips, reduce wrinkles, um, a, a artificial meniscus, bone void fillers, and even heart valve of, or leaflets of heart valves. So, who needs us? What's the problem? Well, the problem is the source. The source of all the collagen so far was dead bodies, dead pigs, dead cows, and human cadaver. And obviously, it's a bad source, or a good source, of human pathogens. And in fact, the FDA already made a notice, uh, already in 2007, asking the companies that develop these products to start and look for better alternatives. Now, there are better alternatives. I mean, take, for example, insulin. Many years ago, we used to slaughter anywhere between 100 to 250 pigs per annum just to supply insulin for a single diabetic patient. Not anymore. Why? Because people, years ago, more than 20 years ago, were able to clone the gene, the human gene that encodes for human insulin, introduce it by genetic engineering into a yeast, same yeast that we grow and make wine or beer or bread, and now we can ferment uh, the yeast and produce uh, insulin. So why not do the same with collagen? Well, the answer is collagen is much more difficult. Insulin is a single gene that encodes for a single protein. In order to make a functional collagen, it requires the concentrated effort of five human genes. Collagen alpha-1, collagen alpha-2, P4H alpha, P4H beta, and LH3. The two first genes are the structural genes that make the triple helix type 1, the heterotrimer, and the, the other three genes are required for the post-translation modification, which is the proline hydroxylation, lysine hydroxylation, or glycosylation. Without all, of that, all these modifications, it's non-functional. So, if you would go to a scientist at one of the companies 12, 13 years ago, asking, why don't you clone all the five human genes into a single host like East, we're probably with the job. And the reason for that is that statistically, it's very difficult to achieve it. Why? Because to optimize a single gene in a single host, it takes anywhere between 5,000 to 10,000 transformation events, which is, each one is independent. So you can figure out the calculation. What is the chance to succeed with five? One to 5,000, time one to 5,000, time one to 5,000, one to five times, mm. it's a very low number. So scientists are smart, they don't do it, right? Well, we decided uh, uh, to take a different approach and take advantage of plants, because in plants, we can actually introduce one gene into one plant and optimize it there. And once we have optimized level of expression, all we have to do is take different plants take pollen from one, put to the pistil of the flower of the other one, wait until we have a fruit, take the seed, grow the seed, and now the seed has the genes of the father and the mother. So by simple crossings, we've been able, in a relatively short period of time, to optimize all the five human genes required to make type 1 collagen, human collagen, in a single tobacco plant. 
So now we have the ability to produce in the plant human collagen, and plants, of course, do not harbor human pathogens. So today there is a company in Israel called Coal Plant that actually uh, uh, make this collagen. In fact, in Israel we have 25,000 square meters of greenhouses all over the country, all the way from the Golan Heights, Upper Galilee, in the middle of the country, uh, in uh, the Arava, uh, more recently in the Bika. The farmers receive these small plantlets of tobacco, looks exactly like regular tobacco, except it contains the five human genes grow them anywhere between 50 to 70 days, harvest the leaves, leaves are transported by cooling trucks, not too far from here, to Yesoda Ma'ala, where we have the factory, where the process of extracting the collagen starts. If you've ever made pesto, essentially the same thing. Just take the leaves, you crush them with a the buffer, squish it, get the juice, concentrate the protein, then the protein is transferred uh, to uh, Science Park in the Chovot, where it gets the last, last day, uh, uh, purification steps in clean rooms, and the end product is 100% pure human recombinant collagen never touched before, not extracted from tissue. And from that material, we're making uh, different medical uh, implants. So I'll tell you about a few. Uh, the first one is a flowable gel indicated for uh, uh, different ulcers, diabetic uh, venous ulcers, um, uh, pressure ulcers, and hopefully uh, re, uh, we, we want to introduce it also to surgical wounds, the heart to yield. Uh, you can see here a full cutaneous uh, wound, uh, a, a, a model in pig model, where we compared uh, flowable gel made of uh, the classic bovine uh, collagen. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the black uh, line here uh, at the bottom, and the, the uh, human recombinant flowable gel is on the top. Uh, you can see that even after 10 days uh, with the bovine collagen, due to foreign body response, adema, and so on, uh, there was still zero uh, uh, closure, while we already reached 50% and maintained that uh, for a long period of time. Uh, we completed the, uh, um, also a clinical trial uh, here in Israel using uh, uh, this uh, uh, product. Uh, it was done uh, at uh, Maccabi uh, Center, uh, ran by uh, Eran Tamir, uh, Dr. Eran Tamir. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, we received the uh, C mark and we started selling it uh, already in uh, Switzerland, in Italy, uh, Germany, uh, um, and, and, and Turkey. Uh, we're still uh, waiting uh, for the Amar here in Israel. <laughs> uh, uh, we all know that it takes some time, but hopefully um, uh, we will be able uh, to see it uh, soon also here in Israel as a product. Um, uh, the, uh, I will just say uh, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, full wound closure four weeks after a single treatment, a single tr treatment with this uh, urinary recombinant uh, collagen uh, resulted uh, with some uh, remarkable uh, uh, results. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is uh, just another case that we got uh, from Italy, uh, from uh, Professor Piagesi in, in, in Italy. Um, this is prior treatment. Um, you can see uh, uh, the wound side uh, five weeks and 15 weeks uh, later, uh, and all that with a single application of the product. So, in fact, the only thing that we recommend here is a really good um, a, a, a debridement uh, uh, process. Uh, a application of uh, the material, and that's it. And secondary dressing that can be done later on by a nurse, uh, a no doctor in intervention. Uh, another product that completed clinical trials here in Israel, uh, led by Professor Niska at uh, uh, Bet Holim Meir, uh, also in collaboration uh, with a group of uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, Gabi Eger, from Asafa Rofe and uh, also Professor Iri Libergal from uh, DASA. Um, uh, this product, uh, which is indicated for tendonitis, uh, this is a soft tissue repair product. It's a fibrillated cross-linked uh, collagen uh, that is mixed um, uh, with the PRP uh, taken from uh, the patient, uh, owns blood, uh, injected directly um, into uh, uh, the tendon. It is indicated right now uh, for tennis elbow, uh, but we hope to expand uh, the uh, 
uh, trials to other, uh, uh, to other um, uh, indications like a rotator cuff, a Achilles tendon, a, um, a plantar fasciitis, uh, and, and also uh, uh, for ACL. Uh, and as you can see here, um, there, there is a great uh, potential uh, 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 to use it uh, uh, much better than the, uh, uh, um, the uh, standard of care today, which is uh, steroids. Uh, you can see by the numbers. Uh, again, this, this product is already uh, received C mark in Europe, uh, starting sales uh, in Europe uh, by Artrex. Uh, one of the largest uh, sports medicine companies in the world and hopefully uh, will be in Israel uh, soon. Well, we're thinking of the future and one of the things we want is to really make strong structures like, for example, artificial tendons and ligaments. And uh, for that, we need strong fibers. So we, we took advantage of uh, a, 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 the, the, the known art in, in textiling and we develop uh, a technology to make very strong collagen uh, fibers by extrusion. So we're taking actually liquid crystals of the collagen, introduce it uh, with a spinneret into a coagulation bath. Once the uh, material hit the coagulation bath, it fibrillates, it self assembles into fibers. We pull it and we start to, uh, uh, to pull and collect the fibers. So you can see here on the left hand side. Now, one of the, the known things about uh, strong fibers is that if you want them to be strong, you need to introduce molecular order. In the industry, they do it by stretching or drawing. So what we've done here, we are now controlling, or you can see on the uh, right-hand side where the rotating spool, the speed of the, the drawing or the collecting. So once we collect faster than we push, we actually introduce drawing. So the question, does it really affect the molecular order? And the answer is yes, you can see on the left, end side, this is a fiber non-drawn, it's an electron microscopy of the surface of the fiber, you see it's bumpy, but once you start to draw the ratio of uh, 1 to 4.9 or even up to 1, point, uh, 1 to 11, you can see much better uh, orientation of the fibers. Now this is the surface, so the question is what really happens with the mechanical uh, uh, properties? Well, the good, uh, uh, the, the, the good news is that the mechanicals are really much improved. In fact, we've been able to make fibers that are so strong. Look at the bottom here. Tendon uh, uh, collagen, this is Achilles tendon collagen, human Achilles tendon uh, collagen, which is the strongest material we have in our body. The toughness of that material is 7.5 megajoule per cubic meter, 7.5. Our fibers is 44, so it's six times stronger than, than, than uh, what we have in our body. In fact, we are not so uh, uh, far from the strongest material on Earth, which is a spider silk. Well, spider silk is still uh, stronger. You can see it's 150, 160, and we are not there yet. But it's already very, very strong. So now the question is, how the cells will behave? How will they respond? So we were growing stenocytes uh, um, and see if they would like, to, if they like this scaffold. And sure enough, you can see that those that are drawn, the tenocytes are aligned and they really uh, uh, bind uh, to the collagen fibers, uh, really aligned uh, 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 along the direction of the fiber. You remember the resin. So we asked ourselves, what's going to happen if we will add a little bit of resin to these collagen fibers? Are they going to be better, more elastic? So the first question is, does the cell like it? And sure enough, cells like it. They don't care about 5% resin, and this is uh, demonstrated by this slide. But what about the mechanical properties? Yes, we've been able to increase the mechanical properties, the toughness by 380%, and be able to achieve fibers which are 300% higher in strain compared to normal collagen. Now, oddly enough, in the future, once we will have artificial tendons or ligaments made of those fibers, oddly enough, the patient will have better performance after the surgery than he had before the injury. And that's gonna be your job. And I'm gonna wrap it by saying uh, the following. First of all, I don't want you to go from here with the uh, notion that uh, uh, we had this great idea of using uh, biomaterials. No, we, 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 we are doing it for many, many years. In fact, the buildings we build are made of cellulose, okay? However, we are limited by the architecture in which the original organism, in this case, the tree, 
lay these nanofibers. We are using these uh, 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 logs because it was made by the tree in the trunk. And the same thing here in medicine, we are using allografts. But, the, but not necessarily the architecture or the uh, anatomical uh, structure of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the patient is really fit the one of the donor. And even when we don't donate to ourselves, look what happened. We take from one side, we crush it or we perforate it, and I'm sure the cells don't like it, just to make it more to fit the, the organ that we want to cover. So, what's in the future? I believe that in the future we'll be able to grow all these nanobiobuilding blocks in plants, like the collagen or the resilin or nanocellulose and many other building blocks that others will find. Extract them, purify them, and then use modern technologies like 3D printing to make, for example, such a heart. Now, this heart is not going to be the same or as good as one we can get from a donor. It will be better and perform more. And I will wrap and say uh, just one thing. I would like to quote a good friend of mine who said the following. If you want a new idea, you should open an old book. And my addition to that is that the book was written. All we have to do is read the text, and the text is the DNA of life. We don't have to invent the will. We have to read the text and embrace nature gift to us. Thank you. I hope it's going to be lighter than the previous talk. And uh, of course, I'm humbled to present this uh, presentation here today. And I'm going to give you the surgeon's light overview on the big data in general, big data in surgery. And we live in a world today of endless data and endless information. Everything today is recorded. This will, of course, influence almost every aspect of our lives, including medicine. And I'm going to try to give you a taste of that in the next uh, presentation. In this picture here, you can see an example of the explosion of data we're having. It shows the overall usage of Facebook last year throughout the planet. The intensity of the light uh, correlates with the hours on Facebook on each point of the globe. The lights you can see in the ocean uh, are the use of Facebook and airplanes and ships. So you can just imagine the amount of data this picture represents and the amount of data um, or the amount of knowledge we can, we can gain if this data is analyzed. Now, is this big data? Not quite. And we're going to talk about that. Yeah. So in the next 25 minutes, I'm going to first of all define the term big data. You know, people use the term big data all the time, but not everybody understands the true definition of big data. And what is the uh, advantage of big data compared to conventional data? And then we'll continue also to uh, big data. Oops. Help me here. OK, then we'll continue to big data and medicine. And we'll talk about the contribution of the genomic revolution to the use of big data in medicine. And finally, uh, we'll talk also about big data and surgery, dreams for the future, and uh, the reality of today. So what is big data? This fellow, uh, John Mache, he comes from computer sciences and uh, economics. He coined the term big data about 27 years ago. And he said that big data is data that is too big to understand in its raw form. And it requires new forms of processing in order to enable insight discovery that will improve decision making. And this is a key point. Analysis of big data should improve your decision making. But what he practically meant was the ability to take large amount of data from various sources and turn it into actionable intelligence, which means making conclusions that can be translated into actions. He talked mainly about increasing the profit of companies, but of course the aim can be whatever you want, including providing better medicine. So this is how big data was defined at the beginning, but along the years the definition of big data was molded and uh, modified, and today we define big data by the famous three Vs of big data. The first V of big data is volume, and here we talk about the sheer size of data in terms of storage and access. You know, big data should be big, but the main point here to understand is that in big data we do not sample. 
In big data, we continuously observe and accumulate data in its true volume. We will not take data on, for example, 200 patients, analyze it, and derive conclusions to all other patients, like we do in conventional data. In big data, we continuously monitor all patients, and each new patient will add new data that enters the analysis and influences the results and conclusions. And this takes us to the second V, which is velocity. And here we talk about the speed of incoming data and the time it takes to process it. And in big data, the analysis is performed all the time, in real time, and constantly changing in light of new incoming data. The conclusions we have today may not be valid or may not be accurate tomorrow when new data is added. And the third V is variety. By definition, big data is composed of a mix of various types of data. And we usually talk about two types. We have the structured data, which is the conventional data sets we all know, Excel files, etc. And we have also the unstructured data, which can be whatever you want. Data from Facebook, from Twitter, website clicks, email, uh, medical records, imaging data, whatever you can think of. And the main challenge of big data analysis is to be able to combine this structured data and unstructured data and to get coherent conclusions. So this is how big data is defined today. Large volume, high velocity of incoming data and analysis, and variety. And this is, of course, very interesting and very appealing, but the problem is it is also very expensive and very difficult to perform. So the question is, what is the advantage of big data comparing to conventional data analysis that we do and always did? So if you look at the pyramid of knowledge, pyramid of wisdom, if you like, at the base of the pyramid we have the pure data. Pure data as a collection of, of random facts is by itself meaningless. But if you start to analyze data a little bit, you can get some information, which is potentially valuable concepts and ideas. But if you want to get more, you need to go deeper and further analyze data and information, and then you will eventually get some knowledge. The definition of knowledge is basically what we know from this data. But most importantly, the effective use of knowledge upon the need to make a choice, upon the need to make a decision, or the effective use of knowledge in decision-making is wisdom. And today we know that if you have big data here at the bottom, with the volume, variety, and velocity we talked about, and you know how to analyze it, your decisions will be wiser, leading to better outcomes. And companies, we all know, understand that. And that's why these companies continuously spend millions of dollars and collect and analyze big data every day. For example, Google uh, knows everything about us, right? They, knows, they know what we search, what we like, what we buy, what movies we see, what music we listen, who our friends are. They continuously collect and analyze big data on each and every one of us every day in order to improve the decision-making about us, about how to make us spend more money, buy more, right? They call it targeted marketing. Now, the, the question is, can we do targeted surgery or targeted medicine? So potentially, yes, it is possible, but we have one, one major problem, that compared to Google, we know almost nothing about our customers. Everybody here is, um, know the feeling of being in the emergency room at 2 o'clock at night and seeing this nice lady comes with abdominal pain or peritonitis, and the feeling that we know almost nothing about her or her disease especially if she doesn't speak Hebrew, and we have no previous data. And today, the data in, the, in medicine is very limited. We have almost no information, and our knowledge is questionable. And therefore, our decisions today are not as wise as they could be. But the, prob the, the question is, are we seeing the end of this era? Are we standing on the verge of data explosion, and a revolution of knowledge in medicine. Well, we heard a few hours ago the lectures of uh, Dr. Olinav and other lectures today, and they've been promising us for quite a while now that uh, we are going to do personalized medicine, right? Each patient will receive its own tailored therapy, specific therapy that uh, fits uh, his or her characteristics. But where is it? Why don't we see it every day? in our common day decision making. And what about the genome? The genome was sequenced almost 20 years ago, 17 years ago. But do we understand the genome today? Can we widely use the data within the genome in our everyday decision making? Well, if I would ask each and every one of you, if you see it in your common day practice, the answer will be no, and you're right. 
But I think that the answer for these questions are going to be yes, very soon. And we'd like to um, give you a taste of how fast these elements are advancing by telling you a short story and taking you with me back to my PhD about 10 years ago. It's going to be five minutes of basic, basic uh, science. Try to stay with me. We're going to do it together. So I came to the Weizmann Institute about 10 years ago um, after my third year in medical school, and my, my lab studied a protein called RANX1. RANX1 is a very important protein involved in many cancers, in some as tumor suppressor and others as, as oncogene. Um, and RANX1 functions as a, a transcription factor. It binds the DNA through a specific binding motif, ACC-ACA. This will be important for later, so remember that. And upon binding to the DNA, RANX1 forms a complex of proteins with other co-activators or co-repressors. And then it can activate or silence the expression of other genes, target genes. The problem was we didn't know who are the target genes of RANX1. What is the molecular mechanism that underlie the functions of RANX1? We knew that when RANX1 is mutated or overexpressed, there's disease, there's cancer. But we didn't know how. So my project was to identify the target genes of RANX1. I had three years to find as many target genes as I could. So how do you do that? How do you pinpoint a target gene of a transcription factor? You perform an assay called chromatin immunoprecipitation. You take cancer cells that you want to study, and then you freeze the cell. You, you perform cross-linking using a specific chemical substance called formaldehyde. You freeze everything inside the cell, so every protein bound to the DNA will remain bound. And then you perform lysis of all the membranes, and you get only chromatin. You get DNA and proteins on it. And then you break this DNA, and you get fragments of DNA, right, with proteins on them. Some of them, ranks one, the proteins we are working on. And these are the fragments that you want to identify. You want to isolate them. So how do you isolate them? You use a specific antibody that recognizes only RANX1, anti-RANX1 antibody. So you use this antibody, and then you precipitate the antibody, you pull it down with specific beads, and you get only the RANX1 bound genome. And then you separate this DNA from the proteins, from the antibody and RANX1, and you get RANX1 bound genomic regions in a tube. Easy. But now think of this. You have a tube, small tube, with a drop of liquid containing the entire RANX1 bound genome. All the target genes of RANX1 genome-wide are within these, I don't know how many microliters of liquid. But how do you know which genes you have? So this is a very important question and a very difficult question to answer. And the answer for that, only seven years ago, was you guess. You go to the library, you open PubMed and you start reading papers about RANX1, RANX1 function, RANX1 phenotype, other targets of RANX1. Just for example, you can see this paper here, published in Nature Genetics only seven years ago, showing that PU1 is a target of RANX1. And this is amazing. You could publish a paper in Nature only seven years ago only by showing that a specific protein is a target gene of other protein. Of course, this paper would never be published today. It's too, too simple. But you read these kind of papers and you collect several candidates that you think it is logical to assume that they may be targets of RANX1. And I had one, one candidate, the gene called HEMGN. You cannot see it here, I'm sorry. HEMGN is also a very important gene. And I had my reasons to believe that HEMGN is a target gene of RANX1. So how do you, how do you validate that? You open the genome browser. We had the entire genome on the, on the computer, right? The genome sequence on the computer. And you go to the promoter of, of uh, HEMGN. And you start go over the sequence and you look for what? You look for the binding site of RANX1, right? The ACC, ACA we talked about earlier. And I found it. But now you can ask me a very important question. You can say, okay, we have four bases in the genome, right? We have A, T, G, and C. So statistically, if you go over the genome, you will find ACC, ACA in about every 1,000 bases, randomly. Okay? Even if the genome meant nothing, if you go over the genome, you will find ACC, ACA in about 1,000 bases. So how do you know this 
ACC, ACA is truly a rank one bind, binding uh, sequence, truly a functional sequence, and not just a random sequence within the genome. So for that, we examined other genomes through evolution, and we said that if this specific ACC, ACA was conserved through evolution in this specific location, then maybe it's truly a significant and meaningful rank one binding site. And you can see that specific, specifically this site was conserved in all other genomes, genomes of opossum, armadillo, mouse, I don't know what you have here, monkey. It was conserved through evolution, so this increases the likelihood that indeed this uh, ACC, ACA is truly a rank one uh, binding site. So now how do you prove that you have this region enriched within your sample? You perform PCR. You design primers for this region. You design also primers for a control non-specific region. And you show that within your sample, this region is enriched compared to a control sample in PCR. And boom, you have a ranks one target gene. And this is what we called searching under the flashlight. You know what you like to find, and you find it. And I did that. It took me about a year. And I was very happy. I had the ranks one target gene. But then one day, my boss came to me and, to, and told me, listen, there's a new technology now, and they are saying that they can sequence the entire sample in three, day, in a, in three days. They can give you uh, the genome-wide targets of ranks one in only three days, all of them. This is the machine, and it costs back then $20,000, and the Weizmann Institute sent one sample for a trial, and uh, luckily for me, it was my sample. And they took the sample, they sequenced the entire sample, and they give you, they uploaded the data on the genome browser, so you can see the entire data on the genome. And after about a week, we got the data, and you can see, for example, here, this is the region of HEMGN we saw earlier, and you can see the, the, the data of rank one binding on the uh, genomic sequence, and you can see here in the promoter of HEMGN, we have four peaks of rank one binding. We had four, not one. But there is also binding of ranks one far away from the promoter. And now you have this data genome-wide, the entire ranks one binding sites genome-wide. And suddenly you have answers to questions you, did, you didn't even imagine asking. And this was mind-blowing, of course. Until yesterday, I spent one year on one binding site, and now in three days I have the entire genome in front of me. So, of course, immediately we performed as many more essays as we could with other proteins, other cell types, epigenetic markers, and in six months we basically elucidated the function of RANX1 in our cells and published a paper in blood. It's also a one-word journal. Um, and uh, if you can see, we have four authors on this paper. Two of them performed the, the analysis, emphasizing the big advantages of high-throughput uh, sequencing. You get huge amount of data, with minimum labor. Today, one sample costs only less than 1,000 shekels, about one and a half, 150, 100 dollars. So this is just one example to show you how fast these elements are advancing towards us, even though we do not feel them every day in our clinic and every day in our practice. And indeed, today, we see hundreds of global initiatives, both, both private and governmental, to sequence as many genomes as possible. We just heard it in the LINAV talk. Um, and just a few examples for that. BGI-3 will sequence one million genomes. It come, comes from China. Sequence one million genomes uh, to better understand the genome. They will also sequence one million genomes of plants and uh, microsystems. Um, Genomic England will also sequence 100,000 genomes focusing on cancer and rare diseases. HLI, which is a private company, will also sequence one million genomes by 2020. Parallel baseline study, and this is a very interesting study, this is actually big data. They will sequence 10,000 genomes, but will also combine this data with data from imaging and wearables like holters and, uh, and pulse watches to better understand the factors of um, cancer progression and cardiovascular disease. And these are just four examples. We have hundreds of these globally. So the future of big data in medicine, and if you ask me, it's going to be very soon, is that each and every one of us will have data on our own genome. We'll know which genes are expressed. We will know which proteins are active. We will have data on our metabolome, microbiome, interactome. 
This will be combined with data from our activity, everyday life, imaging data, phenome, what diseases we have, what drugs we are taking, of course, data from the environment, and together this will enable us to provide effective and specific preemptive medicine and wise decision making upon disease. So this is the future of big data in medicine. But let's talk also about big data in surgery. Can we use big data in surgical decisions? Well, people are now just starting to talk about that. We have several papers starting to talk about this issue. This is one of them, only from last year. And one interesting direction is using big data in surgical complications. If we have big data on surgical complications, and we'll be able to combine this data with patient data, like genomics, age, gender, ethnicity, whatever you want, maybe we could stratify our patients into high, moderate, or low surgical risk. And then we can better decide, decide more wisely, who we want to operate, or not to operate, or whether, or um, to provide some kind of a perioperative therapy that will increase the likelihood of, of a better postoperative course. So this is again very appealing and very interesting, but the main problem again is that we don't have the data. So one initiative to collect this data is the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, the NESQIP, of the American College of Surgeons. Most of you probably know this, this initiative. And they run a prospective database to, to quantify 30-day risk-adjusted surgical outcomes. They have almost 800 hospitals participating and data on over 3 million patients is already collected and this was about six months ago so now the numbers must be much higher and most importantly like in big data the data is continuously collected and reanalyzed we have two V's of the three V's of data here right we have the volume and we have the velocity we don't have the variety though and with this data they constructed the surgical risk calculator and this is a tool that gives you patient and procedure specific risk information. It was built on 2.7 million patients. They practically used 20 patients' predictors like age, uh, ASA score, BMI, etc., including the planned surgery. And they give you the predicted uh, chance that your patient will have any of 15 different complications within 30 days from surgery, including pneumonia, cardiac complications, venous thromboembolism, renal failure, reoperation, leukophanostomosis, length of stay, uh, death, of course, discharge to a rehab uh, facility, any complication or serious complications. And now you can better decide if you want to operate or not. And you can go online, go to the, go to the uh, website and insert the data of your patient. And I tried it, I went to the website, I don't know if you can see it here, and I inserted my patient. This is a lady about to have partial colectomy with anastomosis. You have all surgeries here. She's under 65. She's independent, but has severe systemic disease, suffering from insulin-dependent uh, diabetes, hypertension, and COPD. And you insert all the other parameters, and you get the predicted uh, chance of your specific patient to develop any of the complications we talked about within 30 days from surgery. And of course, in the predicted length of hospital stay, compared to the average risk in the specific surgery that you are planning. And now you can truly better decide if you want to operate her or not. And of course, give her the data. So this is the beginning of, of using big data in medicine. And most importantly, like in big data, this tool, this calculator is continuously reanalyzed. For example, in this paper, they use subsets of patients to assess the correlation between the predicted risk and the outcome and calibrate the calculator frequently. As you can see here, they took all patients and divided them into 20 groups of increasing risk. And they, they, they examined if, if indeed the correlation between the predicted risk and the outcome is good. And they calibrated the calculator. You cannot see it here, but there are circles here and points and dots. The circle is the correlation before the calibration and the dots is the correlation after the calibration of the tool in light of new incoming data. And of course, the dots show better correlation than the circles. Okay, this calibrator, this, this calculator is continuously calibrated and they perform this here, this is for serious morbidity, but they perform this to basically any morbidity of the 15 morbidities we talked about and to every surgery. 
Here you can see UTI, DVT. And of course, one limitation is that the accuracy decreases when the groups are smaller, right? So in colectomy, when you have many patients, the correlation between the predicted risk and the actual outcome is relatively good, even before the calibration. But when you go to pancreatectomy and hepatectomy, when you have much less patients, the correlation, of course, is worse, even after the calibration. But this data is continuously collected, and numbers are getting bigger and bigger, and the data is getting more accurate, and you can better decide if you want to, op to operate the patient or not, and this will, of course, only will get better as data is collected. And now you can ask, what is the advantage? Does it improve the outcome? So indeed, they show that hospitals within the program have significant decrease in morbidity and mortality, and as longer you use this data, the better your outcomes are. Of course, you can say there are other reasons why these hospitals do better, and there is much criticism about the Nesquip in the United States, but there is no doubt that when you have bigger data, you can make wiser decisions, and you will get better outcomes. So is this what we dream when we say big data in surgery? Not quite, and we still have a long way to go, but it's definitely a start. And uh, I think that in the near future, we're going to see big data integrated within our decision-making in surgery every day, so we should better be prepared. And of course, this is open for discussion. Thank you.